Yo guys, what's going on? I'm Tim, he is Justin, back for day 12 of the MLB 30 Clubs previews. We're not going to call it 30 Clubs in 30 days anymore. For the most part, you're going to get one video every day. But as you saw last weekend, after doing 10 of these videos, after covering the NBA All-Star Game and everything, it, it just got too nuts. We had to take some time off over the weekend. And just, uh, honestly, if we had made videos over the weekend, they would have sucked, because me and Justin were drained of energy because we really have been working hard. I know that people think, oh, you just come on here and talk. This takes a lot of research, and talking for like 35 solid minutes is actually a pretty tiring thing. And when you do that day after day after day, which is what me and Justin ultimately want to do as uh, sports show hosts or analysts, when you do that, every day it gets tired but we're gonna be, be here for the rest of the previews and then you're gonna have the divisional previews the award previews and we're even thinking about doing a special where we preview like the top five first baseman and thing like that uh... the nba coverage will continue to come so let's get into the new york mets last season they were seventy seven and eighty five terry collins comes in for his second year as a manager just in off season who did they get and who left all right, when you look at this offseason, they really focused in more into pitching. They got John Roush coming over from the Toronto Blue Jays along with Frank Francisco, who spent um, a time over there in Toronto. Um, he also got Ramon Ramirez. I'm pretty sure they picked him up. Um, you also look over to who they got hitting-wise. No, um, They got Andreas Torres, who they had, I think they traded for. So it was a mostly... This offseason, was, this team was really looking forward into pitching and trying to improve the bullpen. Um, they don't have Pedro Feliciano. Remember, they left him last year. So when you look at when you went into last season, their bullpen was not the greatest. But with these new, with this new team, this new uh, bullpen, um, John Roush is a nice pickup. You also got Frank Francisco. I can see a nice closer role battle coming on now. I think Frank Francisco's got it to start the season because they gave him a two-year, $12 million deal, which I heard a lot of Mets fans criticize. I think Frank Francisco's a nice pitcher, but I'm not sure he's worth that much either. John Roush has done a nice job for the Twins a couple years ago when Joe Nathan originally went down, and then they took the spot away from him in the middle of the year when they were able to acquire Matt Capps, and that kind of threw him off for the rest of the season. So... I mean, it is what it is. This is the New York Mets' 50th anniversary, by the way. 50th year in New York. Obviously, they were in uh, San... For, or, no, what am I saying? Uh, I was thinking the Giants, who used to be in New York. But uh, forget that I even said that. They also, of course, lost Jose Reyes to divisional rival, the Miami Marlins. That is a huge loss. And there have been some rumors about David Wright potentially getting traded. David Wright... Is in the last year of his contract, potentially, and the Mets hold a $16 million option for him for 2013. Let's start with the catcher. You have Josh Tolley coming in at catcher last season in 114 games. He hit 268 with three home runs and 40 RBIs. He's a decent fielder. Uh, doesn't blow you away on either side of the ball. I like Josh Tolley. I think he would be a really solid backup catcher, but as a starter, I don't have a ton of confidence in him. I don't have me neither, man. Um, he's, he will give you that average. He's your average type of catcher um, for three home runs, four yard RBIs last season, 114 games. That's really much you're going to be seeing out of Josh Tolley for years to come. Yeah, I mean, he'll get some more games. Maybe he'll hit seven or eight home runs this year, although it, it's tough to count on that in City Field. They did move the left field wall in a little bit, but ultimately that place, it's the Grand Canyon, and... I, I never understood why the Mets tore down Shea Stadium. I thought it was a really nice stadium. It never really made sense to me why they tore that down. Backing him up a catcher then. Um, oh, my bad. Backing him up a catcher, you have Mike Nikias, who last season uh, with the Mets in 21 games hit 246 with one home run and six RBIs. Ultimately, he's like 28 years old, so I don't see him as much of a catcher of the future either. I don't think that the Mets ultimately have a long-term solution to catcher on their roster right now, so we'll have to see. As we transition over to first base end, you have Ike Davis, a guy who really surprised a lot of guys two years ago when he came out of nowhere, hit 264 with 19 home runs. Last year in 36 games, he played well, but uh, 
and only was able to play 36 games. He hit 302 with seven home runs and 25 RBIs. Got off to a fast start, but then injuries just plagued the rest of his season, and he was not able to uh, really get into a groove the entire season in terms of staying healthy. He should be able to stay healthy this year, and I think that this is a guy you can count on to maybe hit 23 home runs this season. Yeah, that 23 home runs right on the spot. That's where I would give him. This is the future of the New York Mets right here. And this guy, back in 2010, displayed very, very what type of power he has. 19 home runs, 71 RBIs, 264 average, 147 games. This guy is really going to bring it to the plate this year as the everyday first baseman for the squad. And I think he's going to be a solid 23 to 25 home run hitter, man. He's one of the younger guys on the Mets. So as Justin said, he is one of the guys for the future when they are able to ultimately put a... I mean, I'm not trying to rip the Mets here, but you know that right now the Mets are not do not have the greatest lineup out there. So once they're able to put out a solid overall lineup, Ike Davis should really be there because he's very young. Over at second base end, you have Dan, or backing him up at first base. Let me go through that first. You have Justin Turner in 117 games last year. He had 260 with four home runs and 51 RBIs. He's a nice bat off the bench. You'll also see him get some looks at second base and third base as the backup at either of those positions. And potentially he could end up fill, filling that third base forward if Davis David Wright were to be traded as uh, some speculate. We'll have to see there. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Daniel Murphy was a natural first baseman. You saw him make that incredible play the other year with a ball bounced off the bag. It was on Sunday Night Baseball. Um, you know, 109 games last year, he hit 320 with six home runs and 49 RBIs. Really showed a lot of potential for the Mets last year. He broke out really. And I mean, the season before that, he had 266 with 12 home runs. I I have a tough time believing that if he plays uh, over 109 games, that he's going to touch the batting average he had. I would tend to think he'll hit somewhere around 285 to 290, and that's still a nice average. And he's still a pretty young player, only 26 years old. So uh, I think that certainly you will see him there for a few more years. All right, then it. Backing him up, as we said, is Turner. As we look over to shortstop, then you have Ruben Tejeda, obviously with some tough shoes to fill. The 23-year-old coming in now, having to take over for Jose Reyes, the guy who's been one of the faces of that franchise for years. And obviously, there were some people that felt that Jose Reyes was a cancer or whatever. But the bottom line is, you cannot replace a guy who hit 337, could steal you 50, some years 70 bases and was a really solid fielder too. It's going to be very tough to replace that and to replace the uh, the smile. I, I mean, that's the type of thing that led that team and ultimately it didn't lead him to great places. But uh, Jose Reyes was a face of that franchise for years and it's going to be tough to replace him. Ruben Tejeda is all right. I mean, the guy hit 284 last year, didn't give you any power. He had zero home runs, but he had 36 RBIs and gave you five stolen bases. And I think as a full-time starter now, they're going to give him more of the green light to steal. Yeah, this is another guy just like Ike Davis, who's a guy who's preparing for the future, the future of this team. Like you said, this is a guy who does not give you power. This guy gives you average and he gives you hits. He's a speedy shortstop, just like a Jose Reyes. I would not compare him to a Jose Reyes at all. Um, he has appeared in 174 games over the past two years, and I think still we haven't seen the best of him. I'm, I'm, I'm probably thinking here, maybe from the next couple of seasons, we're going to see the best of Ruben Tejada. Tejada. Obviously, though, he is a natural second baseman, so there are some questions about him playing full-time over at shortstop. Backing him up is Ronnie Cedeno, formerly a big prospect in the Chicago Cubs organization, fizzled out there. Uh, he had some a, a decent season in 2009 when he had 10 home runs, 38 RBIs. So if things really don't work out to Hayda or he really proves that he's just not ready yet, then potentially you could see Ronnie Cedeno uh, get some more looks over there. But I would expect that they go with Ruben Cejeda there because he's very young. Backing him up then at short, or as we look over to third base, you have the face of the team, David Wright, a guy who, before they moved into City Field, was a guy that everyone viewed as one of the best players in the game. And I, I remember going to a Phillies game last year when they played the Mets, and they said, you know, he's like Chase Utley. He's that guy that 
the, these people sitting behind us who were idiots, by the way, but they said he's that guy that anyone would love to have on your team. He's that guy that even if you don't like the other team, you have great respect for him. You know, the way that uh, Sixers fans did for Larry Bird and you know how it goes, like rivalry type thing, but there's always one guy on a team that you kind of look at and say, man, I would love to have him on that team. I think everyone still feels that way about David Wright, but last year he had an injury plague season, 254 with 14 home runs. This was a guy whose average has also dropped since they moved to City Field. He was a guy who was hitting 325, 302, 311 in Shea Stadium, and then uh, hitting 30 home runs, and he had 29 two years ago, but Ultimately, the power numbers have just not been there. And I wonder long-term for the Mets if it really makes any sense to lock him up. He's a great player, no doubt. But he's 29 years old. By the time they lock him up, he'd be 30 years old. And again, it's, I'll say what I said about the Jose Reyes deal. Yeah, he's a great player, no question. But locking him up on a team that isn't going to be ready to contend until he's essentially out of his prime is like giving him the money now to maybe not produce in four or five years when he's out of, your, out of his prime and you could use that money on someone who is on, in his prime and it holds your team back. I think that the Mets really need to be patient. They have the option to keep him for next year and they need to get a great package for Ho or for David Roy. And if he does not have a good season this year, then hold on to him, pick up that option and try and move him next season because he is a very valuable piece and whether they keep him long term or whether they decide to trade him, he holds a key piece in what they do in the future because if you do not get a good package for him, it sets your franchise back even more. Now, you pretty much covered the basics of David Reitman, but I really want to ask you this question. There is, I do have this some feeling that I think David Wright is a good fit for the Chicago White Sox if this team does decide to, like, you know, what, we'll ship him off, see if we can get a nice package in return. But I want to hear, who do you think could be a nice suit for David Wright if this team does decide to trade him? Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think the White Sox, because I don't see the White Sox contending. It, it all depends about whether the team that goes after him, whether they want to keep him for the rest of the year or whether long-term they could see him as, as a fit long-term. I mean, there's not a ton of teams that jump to my mind. I mean, maybe the Angels, if they were in contention, could be a fit for this guy. People keep trying to say the Phillies. That's not going to happen. They don't have the prospects for it. Their farm system's been blown up. And they, you can't have... They, Everyone thinks in Philadelphia that you can have a $20 million player at every single position, and that's not how it works. And I really question how long those guys have been fans of the team because it certainly hasn't always been that way. The Nationals just locked up Zimmerman. I mean, Atlanta, I guess, could be a fit. Milwaukee has Aramis Ramirez now. St. Louis has David Fries. Uh, I mean, maybe the Diamondbacks could be a fit. I don't know. Maybe the Giants could be a fit. I think you look at three West Coast teams in the Angels, the Diamondbacks in San Francisco and say they're fit and ultimately if the Dodgers were to surprise contend people they have new ownership and a new TV deal maybe they go after him yeah man so let's look over to left field you got Jason Bay out left field the guy who a few years ago was one of the best all around players in the game he, although he was never a guy who hit for a huge average except for 2005 where he hit 300 but other than that he was normally good for about a 285 average but in 2009, his average dipped to 267, but he had a career high in home runs and RBIs. 36 home runs, 119 RBIs. And since they've moved to, uh, since he signed with the Mets, he signed that huge five year deal worth about $18 million a season. Those type of deals have never worked out for outfielders. I mean, Matt Holliday, it hasn't really necessarily worked out for because he's had trouble staying healthy. Jason Worth, it hasn't really really worked out for so far and Jason Bay's been the worst out of all three when you see these outfielders get these five-year deals worth 18 million they almost never proved to be worth that deal and Jason Bay the over the last two seasons in 2010 95 games 2011 123 games the average is right around 250 both of those seasons the power has pretty much been completely gone and well, a lot of that has to do with playing in City Field. It's not all about playing in City Field. I question what his work ethic has been, and really overall, I think that this is a contract that is really going to hurt the Mets over the next few seasons because they're not going to be able to move him away, and it's money that they could have spent somewhere else. 
Yeah, I agree, man. I mean, ever since he came back to City, the City Field ever came back. Ever since he returned to the Mets, he was drafted by the Mets, and th- these numbers have just not been great at all. I mean, I think it was in 2010 where the season was cut short. He appeared in 95 games, but he missed the whole half of baseball due to an injury. I think he ran to the wall and left field at the Dodger at the Dodgers stadium, which really affected his playing time in 2010, and then last year he tried to come back, 123 games, 12 home runs, 60, uh, 67, 57 RBIs. Um, he did have a pretty, in between type of batting average at 245, and as of right now, I don't know what to expect from Jason Bay in 2012. I mean, he, he can get close right now to 20 home runs. I mean, ever since he left Boston, this guy was a 36-plus home run hitter in his final year with Boston. I mean, ever since he came back, I just don't know what to expect. Injury has, been, has played a big role in this guy, and the Mets just, as of right now, are just wasted money on him. So he, this guy really has got to come back if this Mets team is trying to try to contend this year. they really got to get him back. They really got to get him to his final year in Boston where he can hit you 36 home runs. Well, that's probably just not really going to be able to happen in City Field for the entire year. But it's not just that. I mean, overall, his production has just been awful over the course of the two years he's been there. you got three years left on that contract. And if things continue the way they've been, they might be three painful years at that. Uh, Scott Harrison will be the backup in left field and also will be the starter in right field, so we'll get to him more over when we get to right field. Andres Torres, who was acquired from the San Francisco Giants, um, really only had one good season in his career in 2010, the year the Giants won the World Series. He came out of nowhere, had a really nice season, set the table as a nice leadoff hitter for a lot of the year, kind of faded down the stretch, had some decent games in the playoffs. That year, he had 268 with 16 home runs and 63 RBIs. Last year, went back down to 221, 4 home runs and 19 RBIs. The Mets made a nice move to go get him, but ultimately he's a 33-year-old outfielder who had one good season in his career, really bounced around the minor leagues. And I just do not expect a ton out of him in in this lineup where he's going to be counted on. Well, I mean, I guess maybe even less than he was in the Giants lineup, which isn't very good. But uh, I I just don't see a ton on Andres Torres. And then if you look over to Scott Harrison, a guy whose career was looking up a few years ago, and then uh, he's faced some injuries last year in 79 games. He hit only 235, 7 home runs, and 24 RBIs. If they can get him to the point where in San Diego, in only 112 games then, he was hitting you 17 home runs, giving you about 60 RBIs, hits about 260. He's a pretty decent power threat for the Mets if they are able to have him out there for a decent amount of games. He can stay healthy and hopefully keep his average up. Now, we talked about this before the video, and I agree on... Um with you, I want some finer points here. Well, we, what you get out of Andres Torres and also Scott Harrison is, well, we'll start over at Andres Torres. This guy is speedy on the base path. This guy's very dangerous on the base path as well. Um, he can give you some stolen bases time at time, but I think this is the year where he's going to double his stolen base out of last year. He got 19 last year. I do expect over, I say, 25 plus this year. I think this guy really has what it takes to uh, be that type of threat on the base pass, but you see it, you're going to get a lot of base um, base feeling out of him, like I said. You're also going to see a lot of great defensive baseball out of him, too. So that's pretty much where you're going to be getting out of Andres Torres, and you're going to see a nice average type of hitter in center field. Now, when you look at the backup, Scott Harrison, he has not played a full season of baseball over the past few years. He has played as that type of backup um, reserve outfielder in case like someone has a day off or someone is injured, he's your guy to fill in. But what you're getting out of Scott Harrison is he hit seven home runs, 24 RBIs last year. I see a pretty much repeat of what he had last year. Um, pretty much re- you're really getting out of Scott Harrison nowadays. Yeah, and uh, overall the Mets to me have two fourth outfielders starting in that. Oh, my, my bad. My bad, guys. He is not the starter, I feel. Lucas Duda is the starter. I pulled something up wrong here on the screen. Lucas Duda, we'll give you him. 100 games last year, 292, 10 home runs, and 50 RBIs. He was a surprise for them and really came out of nowhere. Had a very nice rookie season. And, well, I mean, he got a cup of coffee in 2010, too. But for the most part, that was his rookie season. So, uh, 
I think Lucas Duda is a pretty nice piece. You have a nice fourth outfielder in Scott Harrison. And Andres Torres I have my questions about. And I think everyone has their questions about Jason Bay. Let's look over to the starting rotation now. Led by a man who also has quite a few questions. Johan Santana did not pitch at all last season. It bothers me when people say, oh, he's not a good pitcher anymore. Since Johan Santana has been with the Mets in the National League, he has still been a really, really good pitcher. In 2008, the first season, the Mets had huge World Series expectations, faded down the stretch, and missed the playoffs. But he had a huge year that year, 16-7, and with a 2.53 ERA, well over 200 innings that season, really carried this Mets pitching staff. And then in 2009 with them, he went 13-9 and with a 3.13 ERA in 25 games. In 2010, although he didn't have a great record, his ERA was back down below 3 at 2.98 with an 11-9 ERA. He is set to be ready for opening day, the Mets believe. Um, the most recent news, the update they have, I'm reading from MLB.com, says Mets left-hander Johan Santana threw 31 pitches over two simulated innings with roughly five, a five-minute break between them. So, I mean, this is a guy who formerly won a Cy Young. He's up there in age uh, to the point where he's... Uh, 32 now, but these star pitchers, for the most part, can go until 35, 36 years old without seeing much of a drop-off. It's not the way you see with the hitter, and I think if Johan Santana is able to stay healthy this year, he is going to be a guy who pitches at like uh, 15 to 20 wins and has an ERA right around 3, maybe even less, and for all the bad contracts the Mets have, it, while he was a bad contract because he's making $24 million and unless you're out there pitching every game, which he's kind of struggled to do with injuries, he is still a piece that the Mets could say, look, we'll pay $10 million a year, and you pay 14 That helps you to get some of that payroll off the board, and the Mets could potentially trade him this year because he is still a piece that could help a team win the World Series. He's still, when he's healthy, a top-10 pitcher in baseball and a borderline top-5, and I just wanted to make sure people still understand that. I do understand you on a lot of those key points, like you said. This guy is going, I really think that he's really going to bring it this year. Um, last season, it just really killed him. This guy is really a dominating pitcher ever since he came to the Major League Baseball. And this uh, injury just really injured, uh, killed him. So I do expect him to come back 100% sure, uh, 100% sure that he's going to pitch a full season. But when you say he's going to get traded, I don't really see him getting traded at all. This is a the the ace of this team's pitching rotation. I mean, who are they going to look over to? Mike Pelfrey? No. Well, John I mean, that, that's no. not even R. the point, Dick? though. No. Because even with Johan Santana, the Mets probably are not a contender for the next couple seasons. So if you can get that payroll off the book, or at least a chunk of it, maybe that helps you to re-sign a guy like David Wright. I mean, the Mets know that. they, they got to know this. they and it's Sandy Alderson's doing the best he can, but he really is not with the whole Bernie whatever thing, the Ponzi scheme and all that stuff. They, they're bankrupt. They've had trouble with money. I think that he could be traded. I'm looking at the Boston Red Sox, a team who, uh, if they do not end up getting Royals, well, which it doesn't look like they're going to, he could be a piece that fits there. The Tigers are capped out, but he would have made sense there. Texas could be a team that gets interested, especially if you Darvish does not work out as well as people expect. Atlanta could be a team that gets interested because while they have nice pitching depth, they could uh, maybe trade a few pieces. I think that they'd be willing to move on from Jair Jurgens, who was a very good pitcher, to do that. I don't know if they would do that, but it could make sense. I mean, the Marlins, he, he's a piece that fits with a lot of teams in the MLB, and it's a, uh, Arizona if uh, Ian Kennedy, Daniel Hudson, Trevor Kale, one of them doesn't work out. So I think that he is a piece that could get traded. I'm not saying he will, but it could potentially happen. I agree, man. But Johan Santana, this guy coming into the season, I really do have a lot of expectations for him. And I just, well, I see him, I saw him a lot on MLB Network. They do do a lot of coverage over him because this is a guy who is very valuable to this Mets team. And this is just the guy for this team right now. He really needs to stay healthy and he has to come out and play baseball if this team really is really looking for a playoff push. Backing him up, or backing him up. At the number two spot, you have Mike Pelfrey, a guy who 
Another one of these guys on the Mets who looked like he was going to have a bright career a few years ago. He's really been inconsistent for the most part. 2008, 13, 11, 372 ERA, two complete games. That's a nice season. 2009, 10 and 12, 503 ERA. That's a horrible season. 2010, 15 and 9, 366 ERA. 2011, 7 and 13, 474 ERA. This should be a park that pitchers have great success in, and for whatever reason, Mike Pelfrey has not been too hot since they moved into City Field, except for 2010. And he's a piece that they really need to wor get working at if they're going to contend this season. Yeah, he had a complete down season from 2010, from a 15 and 9 record to a 7 and 13 record. I think if the run support is really gonna is really gonna help this team with their pitch. I think Mike Pelfrey does have what it takes to have a complete turnaround season from last year. If they can get a full year out of David Wright and they can get Ike Davis to bring that power, and they can get that average hitting from Andreas Torres, Duda, and um, Jason Bay who can provide the power, but. I think when you look into this season, I think the Metro is slacking in some areas. I don't really, I kind of see a 2009 version of Mike Pelfrey this year. I think he's going to have more losses than wins. So I'm thinking maybe about 11 wins with 12 or 13 losses. At the number three spot, you have another guy for the Mets who was really disappointed. He was a top prospect. He's still only 26 years old, so I'm not going to write him off yet. But in the two seasons, he's really spent full seasons in the MLP. In 2010, he threw two complete games, which was really nice. And one of those was a shutout. Threw 173 innings. Those are all, that's all nice. But when you have a 9-10 and 10 record, which I don't take a ton of stock into a record, especially when the team doesn't have a great season, but a 420 ERA. And, I mean, that Mets team wasn't even that bad. Uh, they were in contention a lot of the season before fading in mid-August. Then 2011, 11-11 and 11 with a 440 ERA. I mean, both of those are awful ERAs. To me, if a pitcher has an ERA over 4, it's a bad season. If a pitcher has an ERA between 3.5 and, and 4, it's a good season. And if you're really below 3.5, you're having a really nice season. And if you're below 3, you're one of the better pitchers in the game. So... John Nees really needs to step it up this season. I, I think that uh, he certainly can, and another guy that should uh, thrive in that park, and he just hasn't. Yeah, Jonathan Nees, he really got to pick it up. I know he said he was, what, 26, you said? Yeah. So he still has a lot more years coming for him. I, I always had this thought that... He was kind of rushed to the major. He came, he debuted in 2008. That could play a big part. And but he does have major league experience. He did play ever since in 2008. But these last two years, these last two full years with the New York Mets, just really nothing really connected the dots with this guy. So I always had this feeling that Johan Santana really has got to work with this guy. And I think with Johan Santana being out, that that has been a big problem with these younger guys. So. Johan Santana does bring that veteran. He's really going to have to help out these young pitchers to get everything ready. And you also got to rely on the hitters to help out, back them up with a run support. They do have a really solid number four starter, though, with R.A. Dickey. One of the, now that Tim Wakefield's out of the game, uh, retiring a couple weeks ago now, uh, R.A. Dickey provide and he makes weird faces when he pitches, but he, he's really gotten the job done since coming to the New York Mets. Maybe he has been one of the guys that's really thrived in the park because 2010, after bouncing around Texas, Seattle, and Minnesota throughout the first five or six years, um, or seven or eight actually, in 2010 he really found it, 11-9, 284 ERA, 174 innings. A lot of people thought that oh, it's just a one-time thing. He even threw two complete games. Then last season, 8-13 and 13 record, that's not great, but a lot of that had to do with the run support. A 328 ERA shows that, yeah, he's not as good as a 284 ERA, but he still is going to be a solid pitcher for the Mets, and he also threw one complete game, threw over 200 innings for the first time in his career by far, and had a whip of 123, which was pretty close to the 119 one he had in 2010. So... For me, Ari Dickey's a solid number four start. He's certainly not a young guy, almost. Um, he's like 36, I think. But uh, he, he has really found himself with the Mets. Yeah, I think he also started pretty hot up into, like, I think June, where the Mets just started coming downhill a little bit. But he is in a solid number four. 813 with a 328 ERA last year. And. I think he's going to 
pretty happy. He's going to improve a little bit in some areas, but I do see a, a solid 10 wins out of him with about 11 losses. Um, so I think he's a pretty much of a retake of 2010. He was he had 11 wins and nine losses. I do see a little improvement in some areas with R.A. Dickey. He is a knuckleballer, so that's the only pretty much known knuckleballer in baseball as of right now, ever since Wakefield left. And then at the number five spot, you have Dylan G, a guy who I think his season last year was nice. He got off to a real hot start, but then people overrated it because he did have some nice numbers, like 13-6 and six is a nice record. Don't get me wrong. 160 innings for a fifth starter, that's nice. Even an opponent's average of 248, that's all nice. But when you have an ERA of 443, I have a real tough time saying that this is a great season. Uh, and Dylan G needs to improve on that number. People need to realize that the ERA shows more because Ari Dickey by far had a better season with the 328 ERA, and the record was not there. But Dylan G had the record, and the overall performance was not there quite as much as Ari Dickey. Yeah, Dylan G is a monster. 13 and 6 last year, but I think it, it also goes with the pitching mechanics with Dylan G. This guy really has got to improve. And I think it's going back to Johan. He's going to help out these young guys and get their stuff controlled. And this team, without guys like Pelfrey can improve in places, Jonathan Neese can improve in places, I think this team has a pretty solid pitching rotation. But you also have that number six guy who's trying to compete, Chris Schwidian or whatever his name is. I don't know why the Mets are trying to let him compete against guys like Dylan G, who last year, like I said, was third. I just don't see this with him getting that opportunity out of this. Pretty solid that he's going to be starting the season down in AAA. He was 0-2 last year with a 4.71 ERA. We are talking about Chris Tweed in here with 21 innings. So I don't know why this team is really thinking about adding a six-man to the six position, which would be stupid and totally out of the question. Well, I mean, so they, they, no, one, no one has, has a sixth man, but he is going to compete and push Dylan G. There's absolutely zero chance. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to yeah. say here. So I, don't, I, don't, I just don't really see this guy really getting a shot into this pitcher rotation unless it's like a late, late call from like a couple weeks until the season is over in, in like September or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I think he might be the long relief type guy in the bullpen, although they already have a couple of those guys. He's either going to be a long reliever or he'll be a, in AAA, as you said. Let's look at their bullpen now. I'll give you their big five guys. You start with DJ Carrasco, was a pickup in the offseason that people had expectations for in 42 games last season after having a nice season in 2010 with the White Sox. He went 1-3 and three with a 6.02 ERA. A uh, really disappointing season out of him. You look at Frank Francisco. That are, let me go to Ramon Ramirez next, and we will play some rapid fire after this. Uh, you look at Frank or Ramon Ramirez, three and three last year with San Francisco, two sixty two ERA, solid pickup. He can even give you some saves in case things with Frank Francisco do not work out. Bobby Parnell has been a guy we've seen even get some starts uh, back in two thousand nine, but for the most part, he did, has done a nice job in the bullpen last year. Four and six with the three sixty four ERA gives you sixty games. That's very impressive. And then John Roush. Um, the, probably the tallest pitcher still in the MLB. Last year, disappointing season, 5-4, four, 485 ERA. But before that, he had been a nice reliever with the Washington Nationals, the White Sox, the Diamondbacks, and, as we mentioned, the Twins. In that season, he had 21 out of 25 saves. That's not great, but it, it's pretty good for a guy that they will have as their setup man. And then, overall, the man who will come in as their closer is Frank Francisco after spending much of his career. If you remember, back in the day, him and C.J. Wilson shared the closing duties, and their careers have gone in opposite directions. Uh, Francisco's career has kind of gone in a weird direction with the Blue Jays and now the Mets, and C.J. Wilson got massively overpaid this offseason by the Angels. So, uh... If you look at what he's done, 25-29 in 2009 when he was a closer, uh, started out really high and kind of faded that season. And then in 2011, last year with the uh, Toronto Blue Jays, he was 17 for 21 in saves. I, I mean, he's, in a, he's a mediocre closer. That's really how I'm going to put it. He doesn't blow you away as a closer. Both him and John Roush have been with the Blue Jays, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, both of them know each other very well. I'm really impressed with what the New York Mets did this offseason, bringing in uh, a big improvement in their bullpen. DJ Krasco, he'd been on the team last year, didn't 
really blow me away at all. But when you add Frank Francisco and John Roush and Ramon Ramirez to this bullpen, I think this team has a pretty solid late in reliever. You have a pretty solid setup man and a really great, I don't want to say really, really great, I'm going to say you have a pretty decent closer in Frank Francisco. I think this team is pretty stacked into the later innings. When you look into their like sort of middle reliever type of guys, there could be some questions. That's where DJ Carrasco comes into play. Beard, Burdick, Beardick, whatever, Manny Acosta. Acosta. They're all right. I think they're, they're, they're coming your age, but this team, they really have their late inning guys stacked up. And when it comes to like the middle, this team could really improve at some places. That could also be where, uh, Shri, uh, Sweden comes in, or if you pronounce his name like that, where Sweden can come in and really bring in that middle inning reliever, say like Powell Free, Nice, and or Dick, or G had those bad outings, that's where you can bring in uh, Sweden. Alright, Justin, have any rapid fire questions? I got four. Um, David Wright, 100 plus game appearances this year. Oh, yeah, I think he'll easily get that. In the year that could be a contract year, I think he will for sure get that. Talking about David Wright, will Wright be traded this year? Yeah, I do think he'll get traded this year. I think that the Mets are in financial issues. And it's really a shame to see guys like him and Reyes go from the Mets because they've been there for quite a while. And at one time around like 2006, the year that the first year would cause Beltron almost won MVP. You had Carlos Delgado come in then. And those guys, it looked like you had a really good team. And all, ultimately the Egos killed that team. And you're going to see them go without really winning a World Series for the, for the Mets. But, uh, yeah, I think David Wright is gone. All right, let's go over to pitching. Let's talk about the healthy guy. We got Johan Santana. A lot of questions about this guy going into this season. I think he's going to pitch out of his mind. I think he's 100% healthy. He's ready to go. Do you think Johan will get 15 wins this season? Yeah, I do, and I think that uh, he is another candidate in the NL. Him, Edison, Volquez are two big candidates for comeback player of the year. All right, wrap it up. Will, there, will this team... Take a breath, Justin. I don't want to... <laughs> uh, okay, 70 plus wins. I don't want to say 80. I think this team does have quite a lot of questions at times, but do you think 70 plus wins is this team's destiny this coming year? I, I'm having a tough time saying that because and uh, people are going to say, oh, you just hate the Mets. No, because I was the one that put the Mets in third place last year when everyone else had them in last. The Phillies are going to be up there. The Marlins are going to be up there. The Braves, okay, let, let me put it this way. The Phillies won over 100 games last year. They're not going to do that again, but they're going to win 90, 95 games. The Marlins are going to be in the 85 to 90 air. The Nationals already won 80 games last year and probably could win 85 this year. The Braves almost won 90 last year and could probably improve if they get Jason Hayward and Freddie Freeman to play for a full season um, at their best. So I think that the Mets are, you're talking about like 67 wins this season, unfortunately, for their New York Mets fans. I have a repeat from the next season, or last, last season. I think this team is going to play some great baseball in like maybe the first month of the season or maybe the first couple of months of the season, but I really, you're going to see what happened to the Mets last year. I think you're going to see a, a slight fall in July, August, and September, but if this team is really going to have to contend, they really got to play 162 games of baseball, and they really going to have to rely on guys like Jason Bay, David Wright, Johan Santana, Ike Davis. Pretty much just, it has to be the whole team that really has got to come together. It's just like regular baseball. You've got to play in mind. I really think this team can really do something in the future. They do have a nice, some young, talented prospects in their minor league system. Dylan G really brings it up, but he's already in there. But this team has really got to, got to rely on David Wright, like, I guess, like, like the guys I said before. All right, so for Mets fans, the future is probably what you need to look forward to. That's essentially what we're saying. Be back tomorrow because we will have the Big Red Machine preview, a team that acquired Matt Latos, made some big, bold moves in the offseason, signed Ryan Madsen, 
Big off season for the Reds, a team that I told you last year would be a down year, and this would be a year that, to really watch out for the Cincinnati Reds. Be here, and you can see if I still agree with what I said a year ago, and you can also hear what Justin has to say on the New York Mets, maybe even KJ. Hit me up on Twitter, at CashKelly underscore TRST. Hit Justin up, uh, what's your Twitter? At the real Justin Gotzi. Not to be uh, confused with the fake Justin Gotzi. We'll see you guys later. Hashtag deuces.